morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the last uh, talk was a tough act to follow. I'll do my best. Uh, and I know I'm standing between all of you and lunch, so I promise that I'm not going to say that cholesterol is bad for the brain. I don't want to ruin anyone's appetite. So uh, I see a mixed audience here, so lots of young people, some middle-aged. How many people here have relatives who have had Alzheimer's? Grandparents, okay. Do people know what the risk is for yourself if you had a relative who had Alzheimer's? How much is your risk raised? It's about two to three-fold. An average person's risk of getting Alzheimer's is about 10%. So if you have a father, mother, brother, sister, grandparent who had Alzheimer's, your risk goes up from 10% to about 30%. Okay? About 25% of all Caucasians, including 25% of uh, most of you in this room, carry a genetic mutation that also increases your risk for Alzheimer's. Asians have a much lower rate of this mutation. So Alzheimer's is a pretty serious condition. Uh, it affects about 5 million people in the US. Another 10 million baby boomers are at risk. And as you follow all the great advice that you heard today, uh, earlier today and later today, as we get better and better at solving heart disease, diabetes, as we get more fit, we're going to live longer, right? And if we live longer, we're increasing our risk for what? Alzheimer's, unfortunately. So, so it's kind of a paradoxical issue where the better we get in medicine as taking care of heart disease, as taking care of diabetes, the longer we live, unfortunately, aging is the single biggest risk factor. But there's some good news that I'm going to tell you before I leave. Uh, and there's also some new information that I'm going to talk about. How many of you did yoga this morning? Great. A study just came out. It's actually making the headlines last week that 15 minutes of yoga produces more cognitive improvement than 15 minutes of comparable time spent doing aerobic, your classic aerobic exercise in a gym. Again, we don't know why. We think it may be a combination of uh, yoga movements, perhaps the insight that you have, perhaps the reduction in the stress response. So yoga is terrific at activating your parasympathetic system and inducing the relaxation response, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So there are two new discoveries about Alzheimer's, which I think are very important for everybody in this room, even though many people in this room right now are in their 20s and 30s. We used to think of Alzheimer's traditionally as an old person's disease. So that's why the name old timer's disease sometimes, right? You heard of, heard of that. Typically, you think of Alzheimer's as striking people in their 70s and their 80s. We're now seeing it earlier and earlier. And now, with some new brain scans, we have evidence that the disease may start 15, 20 years before the memory loss begins. So what that means is that there are many people in this room who are in their 40s who may be having silent Alzheimer's in their brain without their knowing it. I'm not trying to scare anybody, uh, but it's not surprising. When you think about it, you know, heart disease and heart attacks, do they start the day that someone walks into the emergency room? No. Bad lifestyle. Cholesterol plaques have been building up, right? Obesity. You've been eating unhealthy stuff. Inflammation, free radicals. All this stuff builds up over a lifetime of excess. And that's what leads to the heart attack. So Alzheimer's is very much the same thing. So that's the first thing. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit to something lighter. How many people have heard of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger? OK. Before he became governor, what was he famous for? And before he became an actor? Bodybuilding. How many people have heard of Scott Hagwood? Nobody. OK. I'll tell you this very interesting story. So I work at Duke. I'm a doctor at Duke and a, and a brain uh, scientist. Uh, about uh, 10, 15 years ago, Mr. Hagwood was in his uh, early 40s. He had memory problems. He came to Duke. He got himself checked up. And he was found to have a thyroid deficiency. So people whose thyroid hormone is low often have depression, often have memory problems. They're very sluggish. So just because you have memory problems doesn't mean you're getting Alzheimer's. There's a variety of other reasons. The most important is stress, uh, thyroid, metabolic stuff, depression, et cetera. So we corrected his thyroid imbalance, but his memory never got back to where it was. So he decided, you know, he's going to take it into his own hands and try to see if he can do something to improve his memory. So over the next two years, he scoured the internet, looked at all kinds of memory training techniques, 
And he trained his memory to the point where he decided he was going to compete in the World Memory Championship. And he won the World Memory Championship three times in a row. Do you know what kinds of tests that people need to do to win the World Memory Championship? They're probably, my guess is there are 100 people, 200 people in this room. So one of the tests is 200 names and faces you have to match, and you're given five minutes to memorize it. Another test, you have to memorize a deck of cards. Guess how much time it takes to memorize a deck of cards? Exactly. Under a minute, you have to memorize a deck of cards. We scanned his brain. We put his brain under a new type of a machine and scanned his brain while he was memorizing a deck of cards. Not because I wanted to go to Las Vegas and learn all the secrets, uh, but we just wanted to see how his brain differs from the brain of an average Duke student. Now, an average Duke student is not bad, even though you know they've subjected their brains to all kinds of stuff. But um, now, the difference we saw was the average Duke student's brain was very revved up while they were trying to memorize stuff. Lots of regions in the brain were like working very hard. It's almost like a runner puffing and panting as you're climbing a hill. Whereas Scott Hagwood's brain was very efficient, very silent. The metabolic processes were so low. It's almost like the brain was doing it on autopilot. So anyway, so the, the point I'm trying to make is most of us take our memory for granted. There's no such thing as a good memory or a bad memory. There's only a trained memory and an untrained memory. Okay? And likewise, what we are learning with Alzheimer's disease is only a small portion of the risk for Alzheimer's is genetic. A big portion is lifestyle. We have it in our hands. We have it in our power to determine what we want our brain health to be. How many people have read the book Super Brain? No? Nobody? Anybody's read the Alzheimer's Action Plan? Okay. So these are some new books. Uh, there's a bunch of other uh, really great books out there, but I'm going to give you, before I uh, uh, leave in the next five minutes, I'm going to give you four or five tips okay, as to how all of us can improve our brain health. How many people here are worried about their memory? How many people are... Uh, okay, I see a lot of hands. I'm not doing any consultations today, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but feel free to uh, talk to me for a few minutes afterwards, and I'm happy to uh, talk to you. The first, I'm going to answer one simple question that everybody has. How do I know if my problem is due to Alzheimer's or not? And there's a very easy saying that we have. If you cannot remember what you forgot, then you may have a problem. Okay, does everybody get it? So if you forget something, right, if you forget, Forget, like, for example, you know, what I told you today, and it comes back to you two, three hours later, then it's probably okay. If, on the other hand, you completely forget the whole event, you completely forget that there was a conference here at 90 seconds Y and it never comes back to you, then that's a problem, all right? So what are some of the tips that we can do? The single biggest risk factor for poor memory is something called as vascular disease. So first thing we have to do is watch our numbers. What do I mean by numbers? Your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your weight, your blood sugar. So these are critical, your lipids. So these are critical, all right? I'm not trying to ruin your appetite, but the more heart problems you have, the more brain problems you have. So what's good for your heart is good for your brain because your brain needs circulation, blood flow. And studies have shown that people who get Alzheimer's earlier are more likely to have blockages in their blood vessels. They're more likely to have diabetes, they're more likely to have hypertension, more likely to have high cholesterol levels. So diet is the second thing. A heart-healthy Mediterranean-style diet, right? Greek diet, Lebanese diet, all of these are great. Relatively low fat, lots of colorful fruits and vegetables, fish, but small portions of fish, occasional glass of wine. So that's, that's the best diet for your brain. Now, if you happen to be a vegetarian, much better. Because virtually all meat eaters build up Alzheimer plaques in the brain at a much faster rate than vegetarians. And one of the ingredients in curry, turmeric, 
Turmeric has one ingredient called curcumin. Everybody's heard of curcumin? So curcumin, very interestingly, seems to have very strong anti-Alzheimer effects in animal models. There is a plaque that builds up in the Alzheimer brain. Curcumin goes and binds to that plaque, almost like a guided missile. And it helps the brain clear it. We don't know why. In fact, this ability is so powerful, imaging scientists are developing a brain scan based on curcumin to detect Alzheimer's early. So we talked about diet. We talked about watching your numbers. Exercise, very important. Aerobic exercise two or three times a day, uh, two or three times a week, not two or three times a day, uh, right? <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't be working. Um, is amazingly effective in not only just improving the blood supply to your brain, but changing the brain physically. The size and shape of your brain changes when you exercise, sometimes within weeks. Within six weeks, people have actually shown an increase in the size of a person's memory center after exercising. And there, are now a big, there is now a big prevention trial underway to see if regular aerobic exercise three times a week can actually postpone the development of Alzheimer's in seniors or in family members who are at risk. I mentioned yoga. Yoga is amazing. Yoga nourishes the brain. It floods the brain with something called as growth factors. Growth factors are fertilizers for the brain. They help the brain make more connections. And when the brain has more connections, it's kind of like having a better network. You know, you see AT&T advertising saying we have the best network, and Verizon says we have the best network, but everybody keeps dropping calls, right? So the more networks you have in the brain, the more resistant your brain is to something like Alzheimer's. Because Alzheimer's can destroy a few towers here and there, but you can still reroute the calls to other towers. And that's what things like yoga do. And this re-sculpting of the brain through yoga is called neuroplasticity. And all our brains retain the capacity for neuroplasticity. Okay? So and then a couple other things is always be curious, always learn new things. So going to this conference is actually, we can bill for it as a prevention for Alzheimer's, potentially. <laughs> right? So, so keep your brain curious. And the best way to think about it is be like a baby. You know, when you give a baby a rattle, all the baby's senses come alive. The baby shakes the rattle, the baby bites it, the baby smells it, the baby throws it. You know, that's how the brain processes and comes alive. So don't be afraid to try new things, all right? And that's how your brain learns and grows. And when your brain grows, you build up something called cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve means a buffer against diseases. And so that's very critical uh, to build up. And then the last thing, and the most important thing, is socialization. Socialize a lot. The network in our brain is as large as your social network. The more you socialize, the more family support you have, the more sort of personal friendships you have, the more you engage with people, the more resistant you are to diseases like Alzheimer's. Now, I'm not saying that any of these are going to be a magic bullet, uh, but I think these five strategies, I think, can substantially lower your risk. Now, there's lots of new research um, that's coming out, and I'll touch upon it in the last one minute. Uh, we're working to develop some new blood tests to screen for Alzheimer's. We're working on some injections that could be a potential vaccine against Alzheimer's to clear the buildup of plaques. We're also working on a variety of um, uh, genetic strategies to try to reverse a person's genetic risk. And I'm going to give you one example and wrap up. So there was a young woman who was in her 30s. Her family had early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. So familial Alzheimer's disease means it's a different form of Alzheimer's where everybody in the family gets it very young, in their 30s, sometimes in their 40s. So she knew that she was going to get familial Alzheimer's disease very soon. She wanted to have a child that was free of that gene. So we referred her to a fertility clinic that was able to do a special technique called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you take a woman's, you do in vitro fertilization, you're able to select an egg that is free of the Alzheimer's gene, made it with the husband's sperm, and then reintroduced the embryo back, and the woman was able to have a healthy child that was free of the Alzheimer's gene. 
So that gives you a sense of where we're going in the future. So with that, I, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here, and hope you all keep your brains healthy.